But clearly, it would in, it would be in the American interest for them to do it, and that's what if one it of the is he was if it is fully, wait a minute if it is fully functioning is the yield the, that yeah, he, he seems you know, to it's think it's not going to overwhelm everything, but it is certainly going to be Go a on. big step forward in terms of our own tra- balance of trade yeah, with those right, parts. We run a five hundred billion dollar trade deficit every single year. All those factories in China used to be here in the United right. States. As for capitalism preventing wars, we one hundred years ago the two greatest trading partners in Europe were Germany and Great Britain just before they went to war with each other. Yeah, why don't you and Preston Witz go down and go out and have a drink together and stay there for three you or four hours You read enough of the stuff, about. I don't need to. <laughs> don't forget the McLaughlin Group has its own website and you can watch this program and earlier programs on the web at any time from anywhere in the world, McLaughlin.com. Okay, all points bulletin. On the McLaughlin Group, April 20, McLaughlin stated on air that both Canada and the U.S. have literacy rates of, get this, 49%. A grossly erroneous figure. Both Canada and the U.S. have literacy rates of 99%. Chalk the error up to frenetic last-minute note-taking by the host. And thanks to our Canadian viewer, Diane Garrett, for, re- for emailing us on this. Issue 2, Affirmative Inaction. The Supreme Court this week struck a blow to affirmative action. Affirmative action is defined by the Encyclopedia Britannica, quote, in the U.S., an active effort to improve employment or educational opportunities for women and members of minority groups. It was undertaken at the federal level following passage of the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1964. Designed to counteract the effects of past discrimination, it consists of policies and programs that give preferences to minorities and women in job hiring college admissions, government contract awards, and the allocations of other social benefits. The main criteria are race, sex, ethnic origin, religion, disability, and age, unquote. But there have been challenges to affirmative action, namely residents of the state of Michigan in 2006, eight years ago, voted to amend their state constitution to include a ban on affirmative action, end quote, preferential treatment to any individual or group on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin, unquote. This affirmative action ban extended to publicly funded colleges in Michigan. And this week, in a 62 ruling with Justice Elena Kagan abstaining, the Supreme Court upheld the Michigan's ban. Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote the main opinion, quote, This case is not about how the debate about racial preferences should be resolved. It is about who may resolve it, unquote. In other words, who may resolve it are the voters. The 58-page dissenting opinion was penned by Justice Sonia Sotomayor, the Supreme Court's first Hispanic American justice, quote, as members of the judiciary task with intervening to carry out the guarantee of equal protection, We ought not sit back and wish away rather than confront the racial inequality that exists in our society, unquote. By the way, black students at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor today represent slightly more than 4.5% of the student population. That is a 33% decrease from what the population was in 2006 when voters approved the affirmative action ban. Question, does the Supreme Court decision indicate that the U.S. has outgrown the need for affirmative action? I ask you, uh, David Rennie. I think that, is there a gigantic problem with helping particularly African Americans into good colleges? Yes. What the, I think what the court is, I mean, the court was making a technical ruling about this referendum, but I think what they're picking up is that American public opinion is extremely hostile to quotas, extremely hostile to the idea of just bumping people up in the schools. And I think what they said in uh, Justice Kennedy's ruling, which was right, was there are other ways to do this. There are smarter ways to do this, targeting low-income schools, targeting inner-city schools. And I think there, that is where the American public... uh, Michigan now joins seven other states, including uh, California, that have these similar kind of bans. And if you look at the public universities in these states, the number of minorities has fallen. So, no, you can't say that we've passed the need for affirmative action but it is it is challenging the other states to try to find other ways in texas they admit the top 10 percent in all of the high schools uh to colleges and that assumes that these that these high schools are 
pretty much That's segregated, exactly black, right. white, Hispanic. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly right. Yeah, I think it is. And well, then, well, let me tell you. I get to finish my thought, and that, that way you get a diversity. So there, there are other ways to, to achieve this. But I think this is a setback, and I thought Sotomayor's uh, statement, her dissent, is, which is based on her personal experience yeah. and an, a legalistic argument, is yeah. very persuasive. She listen to the conservative action. talk shows and see Look, the way they're ripping her apart. I don't listen to conservative talk shows. <laughs> 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 preserve my sanity. <laughs> <laughs> you mean, I get enough here, John. You mean to preserve your tilt. <laughs> no, John, uh, I don't worry the about that. Justice Sotomayor went to Princeton and went to law school on affirmative action. There is, minorities are doing extremely well in California schools. They say if they had a legitimate contest, 80% of Berkeley would be Asian American students because they do so extraordinarily well. But this decision, John, all it said was that if you want to do away with affirmative action, you can do away with it by referendum. The voters can decide this issue. But I think I'm with Scalia. The Supreme Court has got a test coming up where it's going to hopefully knock in the head all discrimination or preferential treatment based on race so we can get back to the ideal of 1964. Once we get rid of all of the discrimination based on race, we can get back to the segregation we really like. Well, is the NFL <laughs> black I mean, players I are 65 percent of the NFL. They compete very well there. They're overrepresented five to one. OK, a McLaughlin Group preview. The U.S. Congress has failed to pass comprehensive immigration reform. The House Speaker, John Boehner, gives us a hint as to why, Speaker Boehner, when it comes to immigration, what is the attitude of your fellow Republicans, sir? Here's the attitude. <laughs> oh, don't make me do this. Oh, this is too hard. You should hear him. <laughs> We are discussing immigration next week. Exit question. With this ruling of the Supreme Court, has it moved America closer to Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream of a colorblind society, or has it moved us further away from that dream? I ask you, uh, Mort. Well, I think actually it has moved us a little bit away. We've got to find better ways of dealing with it, frankly, than this particular solution of, of uh, uh, you know, having sort of minimum numbers of blacks or whatever it is, because as uh, Pat says, if you look at the Asian population, they, uh, they would get a much larger representation in almost all of these higher uh, schools of education. So it's a very complicated issue. Uh, I have no way, uh, no easy way to solve this problem. Do you think the nation feels that the nation has moved beyond the need for affirmative action? The answer is yes. As a matter of fact, even Sandra Day O'Connor said we should do affirmative action maybe for 25 years more. But I think the vast majority of Americans believe, look, get rid of all racial preferences, all discrimination. As Justice Roberts said, the real way to end discrimination by race is to end discrimination by race. Issue three, lawyered up. When it comes to attorneys, Congress is lawyered up. More than half of those serving in the U.S. Senate are lawyers, as are more than a third of the members of the House. And that's not counting congressional staff. No other profession has so dominated American politics since the signing of the Declaration of Independence. More than half of its signatories, our founding fathers, were attorneys. Some foreign observers, like the vaunted Alexis de Tocqueville, author of Democracy in America, see this as a natural outcome for a country whose constitution has a trifurcated separation of powers and a further separation of powers between the federal and state governments. The political tug of war thus created leads naturally to litigiousness and adjudication. Others are dubious, quote, a legalistic approach to politics is no longer serving America well. Politicians of both parties are too eager to denounce the other side's conduct as not just wrong, but as illegitimate. What room does that leave for compromise? Unquote. So says Lexington, who is with us today in The Economist magazine. We've uncovered you. Your non diploma is <laughs> not saving you. You're Lexington. I am. All right, you say here, the dangers of taking a legalistic approach to America's budget wars. Lawyers, beware, beware lawyers. What, what points are you making in here that lead you to uh, conclude that we should sack them all? I think the problem with having so many lawyers, and it really is a dramatically larger number of lawyers. If you look at, say, the House of Commons, it's, it's like one in 12 is a lawyer. The problem is 
a lot of the disputes that America is facing are essentially political arguments. How big should government be? What do you, how much redistribution do you want? But there's something unique about a Congress full of lawyers where instead of saying you're right or you're wrong, it's let's impeach the president. This is unlawful. This is an illegitimate use of powers. That's a very lawyer's way of approaching things. It's very striking. I used to cover politics in Europe. Protesters in Europe, they hold up banners saying that the prime minister should resign. Protesters in this country very often say impeach the president. You have that very legalistic approach. And the problem with that is you're sort of not allowing your opponents to argue yeah, the right. politics of it. You get into this kind of very deadlocked uh, sort of you legalistic approach. You mean instead approach. of seeking compromise, it's all or nothing at all? Yeah, because if they're unlawful, then there's no room for compromise. There's no room yeah. for discussing the yeah, politics. We, are, well, the we have a different system. Goes back. Well, the we, we, have a, we don't have a parliamentary system where, in a sense, you can get a government to resign. You have a, a system here where you are elected for a particular period of time, mm -hmm. four years, and you just don't have a government that resigns. You have to impeach them if you want to get them out of office. That's our system. It's very different than it is in the European system. What do you think of that? But designed by laws. You're right that clearly it's not a parliamentary system, but I think the sheer fact that you have these gigantic numbers of lawyers, really you know, half the Senate, a third of the House, does make them very keen to make these legalistic... Well, kind of John, what, do you mean, what do you mean by legalistic? Well, it's always saying, you know, Congress is, you know, when you're having essentially a political dispute about shutting down the government, you end up with members of Congress saying, you know, the President uh, is overstepping his legal bounds. Well, the problem, legal problem is... You work for Richard Nixon. Did Re Richard Nixon ever complain about an excess no, of lawyers in the government? No, but he wasn't. He's they did himself. try to impeach him, but the problem is, is <laughs> not the lawyers. The problem is deep and irreconcilable ideological conflict and divided power in government. Hold on, quickly, not five the seconds. The number of lawyers is the fact that they're all bought off by business interests. Oh my god. The lobbies. Well, too many lawyers among the lobbyists. Precisely stated. <laughs> but I'm not saying well stated, are you? I'm not saying well stated, no. <laughs> False prediction. Globalism is dead. Putin killed it in Crimea. The new 21st century rules of order are disorder. Too much. Wrong. Way too simplistic. NATO's still there. Oh, no, no, that's wrong. That's way off mark. the mark. More right than wrong. Bye-bye. The McLaughlin Group is brought to you by Siemens. Every day, Siemens Answers are helping build the future of America. Siemens Answers. Why are you still sleeping? I just wanted to check and make sure that we were on schedule. The first technology of its kind... Mom and Dad, I have great news. ...is now providing answers families need. Siemens. Answers.